from April 1971 to September 1972, Washington, D.C. and Prince George County, Maryland, were terrorized by a serial killer who preyed on young African-American girls in the I-295 area. The homicides were believed to be the first serial killings in Washington. The killer abducted and murdered at least six young black girls and dumped their bodies on the side of the road. The media dubbed him as the Freeway Phantom. On April 25, 1971, 13-year-old Carol Spinks, an identical twin known to her family as Bebe, left home to go to a 7-Eleven store wearing blue gym shorts, a red sweater, and brown socks four blocks away from her family's apartment. Carol came from a large family of eight kids. She was a shy seventh grader who loved playing jacks, jumping double dutch, and hula hooping. Her older sister, 24-year-old Valerie, who lived across the hall, had given her five dollars to go buy TV dinners, bread, and soda. Valerie knew that their mother had told the younger children not to leave the house while she visited an aunt in Brentwood, Maryland. The children were aware of the consequences of disobeying their mother's rules, yet Carol took the risk anyway. Outside, her mother saw her, ordered her to go straight home after buying the items, and promised her a whipping when she returned. Unbeknownst to her, this would be the last interaction she would have with her child alive. Carol, barely five feet tall and 100 pounds, never came home. Her mother filed a missing person report that night. She and the community scurried the neighborhood searching for Carol. Six days later, police found the body of the young teen dumped along an embankment of I-295. Children playing in a grassy area along I-295 behind St. Elizabeth's Hospital had stumbled across the body and flagged down the police. She had cuts to her face, neck, chest, and both hands. Her nose was bloodied. She'd been sodomized and strangled. She was missing her shoes. An autopsy determined that she'd been dead for two to three days, which suggests that she'd been kept hostage before she was killed. Citrus fruit was found in her stomach. It is believed that her killer had fed her. The 7-Eleven clerk told authorities that he'd seen Carol leave the store with her purchases, and a 14-year-old on the way to 7-Eleven with her mother and sister remembered passing Carol carrying a grocery bag. Green synthetic fibers had been found on Carol's clothing. Three months after the first murder, the phantom struck again. A DC Department of Highways and Traffic employee along 295 had car trouble and pulled off the road. When he exited his vehicle, he saw a body and called the DC police. This was the second call police got that morning about the same body. The dispatcher sent officers. The officers radioed a 10-8, which means that they found nothing and were moving on. They didn't get out and look for the remains. They just drove by. A week later, on July 19th, one of the callers went back to the site and saw that the body was still there, deteriorating in the unforgiving heat. The ineptitude of the police angered the man. He told his boss who drove by, saw it, and called his friend Charles Baden, a police sergeant. Baden was off duty that day. He rode on his motorcycle to the location on the freeway opposite 295 north of Bowling Air Force Base until he found the corpse. The remains were just 15 feet from where Carol had been discovered. The victim was 16-year-old Dylenia Johnson, who had told her mother she was going to work at her summer job at Oxen Hill Recreation Center on July 8th. The day afterwards, her mother reported her missing. 
Dalinia said that she would be spending the night at a sleepover the center was having for kids, but she never showed up to work. Instead, she was found 11 days later, her face and body so badly decomposed that the medical examiner had to cut off her fingers to identify her. Back in the 70s, there was no DNA testing, so authorities used fingerprints. The cause of death couldn't be determined. If they had found the body sooner, they may have been able to determine what the cause was. The police task force explored every lead, including a four-star general, a St. Elizabeth psychiatrist, and a wealthy Prince George's developer who owned property in Southeast. They questioned a man who owned a teen club where Dalinia hung out. They questioned another man who someone allegedly saw in a car with Dalinia after she was reported missing. The police used sodium pentothal on him. It is believed that this was the first time the department used the truth serum. The man was cleared. In the wake of the murders, parents kept their children close by in Southeast. So the killer went Northwest to continue his reign of terror. Nine days after the body of Dalinia was discovered, a hitchhiker found a body on Route 50 in Cheverly, just across the district line. It was 10 year old Brenda Faye Crockett. Brenda was a dimpled little girl, four feet six and 75 pounds. She had a lot of friends and loved taking pictures and attending church. Brenda had left home barefoot while wearing blue and white print shorts, a matching halter top, and pink foam hair curlers. She had been making a trip to Safeway near 14th and U Streets in Northwest to buy bread and pet food for the family's three dogs, Ringo, Rex, and Romeo. Her mother sent her out around 8 p.m as the neighborhood kids were preparing for movie night on their street. Brenda's mom thought that she had taken a friend with her. When Brenda didn't return after an hour, her mother went looking for her. She left Brenda's seven-year-old little sister at the house with her boyfriend. At 9.20, the phone rang. It was Brenda. She told her sister that a white man had snatched her up and took her somewhere in Virginia but was sending her home in a taxi. She was weeping. 25 minutes later, she called again and talked to her mother's boyfriend who asked if she knew where she was in Virginia. No, she said and asked, did my mother see me? How could your mother see you if you're in Virginia? The boyfriend said and told her to put the man on the phone. Well, I'll see you, she whispered before the line went dead. Brenda's body was found less than eight hours later. Her bare feet were pristine, as if they'd been washed. She'd been strangled and raped. She also had green synthetic fibers on her clothing, the same as Carol Spinks. It has been theorized that the killer knew her mother and the purpose of the two strange phone calls was to find out if she had seen him with Brenda. On October 1st, 1971, 12-year-old Nino Moshia Yates went missing. She had gone to the Safeway a block from her family's apartment in the 4900 block of Benning Road Southeast around 7 p.m. to buy sugar, flour, and paper plates. Her stepmother had just recently given birth and her father was with his wife and newborn at the hospital. She disappeared on her way home. A 16 year old boy found her still warm two hours later along Pennsylvania Avenue, just east of the district. The sixth grader had been strangled and raped. Green synthetic fibers were found on her clothing. After Nino Moshia's body was discovered, the media pressed the police about whether the homicides were connected and began referring to the killer as the Freeway Phantom. 
The police began to think there was a serial killer on the loose. Six weeks later, the fifth victim was found. 18-year-old Brenda Woodard went missing on November 15th after stopping by Ben's Chili Bowl with a friend from Cardozo High School in Northwest. Her classmate usually drove her home, but his car was in the shop, so they both took the bus. Brenda got off at 8th and 8th Streets, Northeast, and transferred to another bus while her friend stayed on the bus. 22-year-old Chevrolet police officer David Norman saw her body on Hospital Drive south of Route 202 near Prince George's Hospital while he was on patrol shortly before 5 a.m. He shined his flashlight in her eyes to see if there was life. She didn't blink. She didn't do anything. Her burgundy crushed velvet coat was draped over her body. Her black turtleneck was turned inside out. Buttons were missing from her coat and skirt. She'd been raped, strangled, and stabbed four times. Defensive wounds were on her hands indicating that she'd fought her killer. The attack was especially brutal, but her shoes were left on. A note written in pencil was stuffed in her pocket. It read, This is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. It was signed, Freeway Phantom. Authorities are certain Brenda wrote the note as dictated by the killer because the FBI matched other writings by her. It was written in normal handwriting and with punctuation. Because of this, it is believed that she knew her killer. There were no signs that she was nervous when she wrote the note. You don't think calmly like that if someone has kidnapped and assaulted you, an expert declared. Ten months passed leading the police to think that the freeway phantom had left the area or gotten locked up for other crimes. This could certainly be true, but it's likely that this was just a cooling off period for the freeway phantom. On September 6, 1972, the body of 17-year-old Diane Williams was found by a trucker. The high school senior who attended Bello Senior High School had spent the evening with her boyfriend. He walked her to the bus stop for her ride home to Haley Terrace in Southeast. Diane had been strangled and left along I-295 about 200 yards south of the DC line. Diane was written in capital letters on one of her white sneakers and $1.26 was in the hip pocket of her jeans. The coroner reports that the Freeman Phantom brutally raped his victims with penetration of up to nine inches deep, anally and vaginally. He bathed his victims. Experts say that he did this because he was trying to wash himself of the guilt from killing the young girls, or he was aware of police techniques in the 1970s, and he was attempting to wash away trace evidence, not realizing that when he threw the girls on the floor, he was picking up trace evidence. The authorities suspect that the green rayon fibers found on the girls came from a bath rug or other carpet. No one knows who the killer was, but a major clue about the freeway phantom's identity is that his geographical anchor point was St. Elizabeth's Hospital, a mental asylum in Washington, D.C. This suggests that the killer was familiar with the facility and may have been a patient, doctor, or a worker who knew the area well. Another clue is that the freeway phantom appeared to keep trophies of his victims. He kept textbooks from one of the girls, curlers from another, and shoelaces from another. He stopped the killings in 1972. Investigators believe that means he either died, was incarcerated, or moved away from the area at the time. The police suspected several people of the crimes. In the 70s, a group known as the Green Vega Rapists were seen as potential suspects. One of the gang's members confessed that his colleague had committed the crimes. He eventually stopped communicating with authorities after his allegation became public and he feared retribution from the gang.
Police have since stated that the Green Vega rapists were not the likely perpetrators. Authorities say that they couldn't have been responsible for the murders because the information the men provided the police came straight from news reports and they knew nothing about the note found on Brenda Woodard along with the fact that none of the hair samples from the men matched the hairs found on the victims. Police looked at another more likely suspect, a man by the name of Robert Askins. Robert was a convicted kidnapper and rapist who had been charged three times with homicide. He had spent time as a patient at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. He had a problem with women that went back to the 1930s. He tried to kill them, and he successfully did kill them. When the authorities raided his home, he had saved an appellate court opinion where the, court, where the word tantamount was used, just like in the freeway phantom letter that was left on Brenda Woodard's body. Robert was also allegedly known to use the word often in conversation. In addition to this, they found soiled women's scarves, photos of girls and young women, a knife used in another crime, and an essay from a girl. The police obtained another warrant a month later and searched Robert's vehicle. They found two buttons and a gold earring under his back seat. In the end, there was no physical evidence to tie the crimes to Robert, and he denied all connection to the Phantom Highway murders. The green fibers found on five of the six victims didn't match the fibers found in his home or car, and the hairs found on them came back negative. He was convicted of